Hello and welcome back to another episode of Quotes This Week presented by Live Law. I am your host Syed Amir Hussain and I'll take you through the most significant courtroom developments from across the nation, from the Supreme Court to the local courts. I've got you covered with crisp and clear summaries. But for a deeper understanding, I will always encourage you to check out the news articles available on our website www.livelaw.in. In this episode, we are going to talk about the Supreme Court's highly anticipated same-sex marriage judgment, the latest developments relating to Chandra Babu Naidu's pleas, a PIL over the women's reservation bill, the news click arrests and much more. So let's dive into the headlines. This week, the Supreme Court delivered its highly anticipated judgment in the same-sex marriage case which was reserved in May. Four separate opinions were pronounced by Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachud and Justices S.K. Kaul, Ravindra Bhatt and P.S. Narsimha. While refusing to grant the right to marry to queer couples, the court directed the Union of India to form a committee to examine their rights and entitlements, excluding legal recognition of their relationship as marriage. In his judgment, the Chief Justice of India, supported by Justice S.K. Call, in his concurring opinion, held that the court could not strike down the provisions of Special Marriage Act because that would leave a lacuna in the legislative framework. Nor could it read into the act anything that would grant legal sanction to queer marriages in view of the separation of powers between judiciary and legislature. At the same time, CJI Chandrachur noted that the union's commitment to forming a committee to decide the rights of people in queer unions. Additionally, he recognized the right of transgender individuals in heterosexual relationships to marry under the current laws and the right of unmarried couples, including queer couples, to jointly adopt a child. In that context, Chief Justice Chandrachud held that Regulation 5 Subclause 3 of the CARA regulations insofar as it prohibited unmarried couples from adopting was in violation of Article 15 of the Constitution. However, three judges of the bench disagreed with the Chief Justice's conclusion regarding the constitutionality of CARA regulations. Justice S. Ravindra Bhatt with Justice Hima Kohli concurring with his opinion and Justice P.S. Narsimha upheld the constitutionality of CARA regulations. Justice Bhatt emphasized that marriage was a social institution without an absolute right, cautioning against the gender-neutral interpretation of the Special Marriage Act to prevent unintended vulnerabilities for women. He also underscored the need for high-powered committee to address concerns regarding the benefits of queer partners. Similarly, Justice P.S. Narsimha stressed that the right to marry was not an absolute right, neither was it a fundamental right. You may find some aspect of this judgment confusing since four judges penned separate opinions. So for a more comprehensive understanding, you can read our articles breaking down the same-sex marriage judgment on our website www.livelaw.in. We have two important updates from the Supreme Court over the criminal proceedings faced by N. Chandra Babu Naidu, former Andhra Pradesh Chief Minister and current leader of opposition in the YSR Congress Party ruled state. The Supreme Court has reserved Naidu's plea to quash criminal proceedings against him in a skill development scam case. Senior advocate Mukul Rodgi appeared for the Andhra Pradesh Crime Investigation Department, which is probing the senior politician's role in the alleged scam that took place during his tenure as the Chief Minister. Among other things, Rodgi cautioned against nipping this investigation at the bud at this stage, emphasizing the losses to the tune of hundreds of crores suffered by the public exchequer. On the other hand, Naidu, represented by a battery of lawyers including senior advocates Harish Salve, Abhishek Manu Singhvi and Siddharth Luthra argued that this case was of a case of regime revenge. Much of the debate revolved around the application of Section 17A of Prevention of Corruption Act, while Naidu's lawyers argued that the investigation and the remand order admitting him to the custody were bad in as much as the prior sanction requirement under Section 17A was not met, Rodgi said that the provision would not apply to the investigating dealing with the offences before the provision's introduction in July 2018. Naidu, however, insisted that the sanction provision would apply retrospectively. Notably, while reserving the verdict, Supreme Court also declined to grant interim bail to Naidu in this case, despite fervent appeals on behalf of Telugu Desam Party President. Next, we turn to a development regarding Chandra Babu Naidu's anticipatory bail plea in the Fibernet scam case. Naidu has been accused of playing a key role in the Andhra Pradesh Fibernet scam that happened during the Telugu Desam Party term in the state. The Andhra Pradesh Crime Investigation Department has accused him of exerting pressure on officials to favour a certain company that was awarded the Fibernet contract. 
Despite its alleged lack of necessary qualifications, this case was registered back in 2021 and Naidu was recently implicated after his arrest in the skill development scam case. Naidu has called this a politically motivated decision. Earlier this month, his plea for anticipatory bail in this case was dismissed by Andhra Pradesh High Court. After that, he approached the Supreme Court, which, while issuing notice in the plea, asked the state to not act on production of warrant against him after Luthra raised concern about an imminent arrest. This week, the anticipatory bail hearing was adjourned until November 9th, and along with it, the interim arrangement directed to continue until then. The Supreme Court has reserved its decision on the bail plea of the former Delhi Deputy Chief Minister Mani Sisodia, who faces allegations of money laundering and corruption related to the erstwhile liquor policy in the national capital. He is currently being investigated by both the Central Bureau of Investigation and the Enforcement Directorate and has been lodged in jail since February this year. Sisodia has appealed against the denial of bail by the Delhi High Court in both the CBI and ED cases. During the final argument, Sisodia's counsel, senior advocate Abhishek Manu Singhvi, emphasized that no evidence implicated Sisodia in any bribery activity related to the case. On the other hand, additional solicitor general S. V. Raju contended that the central agencies has unearthed evidence that place him in the middle of the conspiracy to allow private wholesalers to have an unreasonable profit margin of 12% under the new liquor policy, pointing to particular his proximity with Vijay Nair. The law officer also accused Sisodia of tampering with evidence, referring to a mobile phone that he allegedly stopped using the day Lieutenant Governor of Delhi asked the CBI to initiate an investigation, which Raju claims has not been traced. When questioned by the court over the delay in trials in which charges have not been framed yet, ASG Raju argued that Section 207 applications to inspect documents not relied on by the prosecution were among the root causes. Nevertheless, the court cautioned that the man could not be kept in jail infinitely and the arguments on charges ought to have begun promptly after the charge sheets were filed. Another notable development before the court reserved its verdict is the government law officer's statement that the Enforcement Directorate was contemplating and pleading the Aam Admi Party in the money laundering case as an accused, as well as the probe into the aspect of its vicarious liability under Section 70 of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. When Singhvi raised concerns about the nature of this statement, the court assured the senior counsel that it would not impact the decision on Sodia's bail before proceeding to reserve the judgment. For more information, log on to www.livelaw.in. This month, the Delhi police conducted raids on the residences of prominent journalists associated with NewsClick, questioned 46 suspects, seized their electronic devices, and finally, at the end of the day-long search, seizure and detentions, arrested NewsClick founder and its editor-in-chief Prabir Purkastya and Amit Chakravarti, the organization's human resources head, under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, that is UAPA. This came on the heels of allegations that the portal received funds from pro-China pro propaganda. The duo is presently in judicial custody after the Delhi High Court upheld their remand order last week. They have now approached the Supreme Court. Purkastya and Chakravarti had argued before the High Court that the grounds of arrest had not been supplied to them in writing, citing the Supreme Court's recent judgment in Pankaj Bansal, declaring the certain arrests under the PMLA as illegal for not providing them grounds in writing. Solicitor General Tushar Mehta, on the other hand, contended that while the grounds of arrest had not been supplied, the duo had been informed of them. Ultimately, Justice Tushar Rao Gadela upheld the police remand order, holding that the grounds of arrest had indeed been conveyed to them and that the Pankaj Bansal ratio would not strictly apply to the arrest under the UAPA. The same question had been raised before the Supreme Court, which after a brief courtroom exchange issues, issued notice to their special leave petitions. At senior advocate Kapil Sibbal's behest, this court also agreed to schedule the hearing as early as possible, which was on 30th October. We'll be back with more updates on this. Log on to www.livelaw.in for further information. In a significant development, the Supreme Court has issued a clear directive to the union government and all state governments to completely eliminate the deplorable practice of manual scavenging. This practice involves the unsafe and degrading manual cleaning of human waste and sewage. The 2013 Prohibition of Employment as Manual Scavengers and their Rehabilitation Act criminalizes this activity, emphasizing the identification, rehabilitation and the financial assistance for manual scavengers. 
while imposing strict penalties for non-compliance. Despite legal restrictions, the practice persists, disproportionately affecting marginalized communities and posing a significant societal challenge. In a PIL addressing manual scavenger employment, the Supreme Court bench comprising Justices S. Ravindra Bhatt and Arvind Kumar directed an increase in compensation for sewer-related fatalities and disabilities along with an active measures for victim rehabilitation, including educational scholarships and skill development programs. The bench also issued 14 comprehensive directives to the union and state governments aiming to ensure effective implementation of the 2013 legislation. For more information, log on to www.livelaw.in. India's judicial system has grappled with a persistent backlog of cases leading to delayed justice and prolonged legal proceedings, ultimately depriving citizens of their right to timely and equitable resolution. The Supreme Court expressing deep concern over this issue has issued a series of directives to expedite case disposal. Ahead of the retirement, a bench headed by Justice S. Ravindra Bhatt issued these directions while hearing a case that had been ongoing since 1982, spanning 43 years. The bench has outlined 12 measures for the high courts to ensure swift trials and monitor the resolution of cases, particularly those pending for over five years. Highlighting nationwide pendency statistics, sources from the National Judicial Data Grid, the court also emphasized the need for collaborative effort from both the bar and the bench to tackle this long-standing problem. For more information, log on to www.livelaw.in. The Supreme Court's recent consideration of a 26-week pregnant woman's plea for medical termination of pregnancy has undergone several developments over the last two weeks. This plea was filed on the ground that the petitioner, a married woman with two children, is suffering from postpartum psychosis and is not in a position to raise a third child, emotionally, financially and physically. In initially permitted by a bench of Justices Hema Kohli and B.B. Nagaratna, the case was revisited after Ames doctors said that the fetus had a viable chance of being born. While Justice Nagaratna echoed her earlier views, Justice Hema Kohli said that her judicial conscience would not permit the woman to undergo an abortion in view of the medical report, leading to a split verdict. The matter was then referred to a three-judge bench headed by Chief Justice Chandrachur, which stressed the delicate balance between a woman's autonomy and an unborn child's rights under the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act. Last week, the bench had asked AIMS to conduct an independent evaluation of the mental and the physical condition of the petitioner and to examine if the medicines taken by her had any effect on the fetus. Despite the latest report affirming the postpartum psychosis diagnosis, the three-judge bench finally decided to reject the petitioner's plea for abortion after noting that the absence of an immediate threat to the mother's life or any fetal abnormality, which are the only two exceptions to terminate a pregnancy beyond the 24 weeks prescribed under the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act. The court, however, clarified that the cost of all medical procedure in the matter would be borne by the state and the petitioner would have the ultimate say on whether she wanted to keep the child upon being born or give it up for adoption. For more information, log on to www.livelaw.in. Last week, the Supreme Court revealed that almost all of the 70 recommendations made by various High Court collegiums had been forwarded by the Centre after the Court's latest rebuke, while hearing a contempt petition against the Central Government for not adhering to the timeline prescribed by the Court in 2021 for clearing collegium proposals. The Court also revealed that seven names reiterated by the Supreme Court Collegium, nine names proposed for the first time, one Chief Justice promotion and 26 transfer proposal was still pending. In particular, the Court stressed the Chief Justice vacancy in Manipur High Court, which is now having to frequently issue directions with respect to the ongoing ethnic clashes. The Collegium's recommendation to appoint Delhi High Court Judge Justice Siddharth Midul to this position was pending since July. Firstly, Justice Siddharth Nidul has been appointed as the Chief Justice of Manipur High Court. The Centre also cleared a number of appointments and transfers of High Court judges over the last two weeks. During this week's hearing, the Court took note of this positive development but reiterated its concerns about the segregation of names and pendency of certain collegium proposals. As of now, there are five reiterated names, five fresh names and 11 transfers pending. Urging additional Solicitor General Barbir Singh, appearing for the central government to notify the remaining collegium recommendations promptly, the court adjourned the hearing until November 7th. For more information, log on to Live Law. 
Last month, the parliament passed the Women's Reservation Bill with broad bipartisan support. Later, the central government notified the Constitution 106th Amendment Act 2023 in the official gazette after the President of India gave her assent to the bill. This act seeks to reserve one-third of the seats for women in Lok Sabha, state legislature and the Delhi Legislative Assembly. One-third of the total number of seats reserved for women will further be reserved for women from scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in an effort to provide horizontal reservations for these disadvantaged sections. However, this act will only come into effect after a delimitation exercise following the first census conducted after the bill's enactment owing to the operation of the newly inserted Article 334A, which other than stipulating the time when the reservation will come to an end, also lays down when it will be enforced. During the parliamentary debates, members of the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party also clarified that the act will not be implemented before the upcoming general elections in 2024 and it might not get enforced at all before 2026. In the latest development, Congress leader Dr. Jaya Thakur has approached the Supreme Court urging the immediate enactment of this before the 2024 general elections. The plea has challenged the provision that proposes a delayed implementation of the constitutional amendment as void ab initio and emphasized the urgency of implementing this act which was passed with such broad support across party lines during a special session of the parliament. For more information, go to www.livelaw.in. In a significant development from the Allahabad High Court, all accused in the Nithari killings case have been acquitted. Surinder Kohli, previously handed death penalty in 12 cases by the trial court, has been cleared of all charges. Similarly, Munender Singh Pandey, initially sentenced to death in two cases, has also been acquitted. The case pertains to the infamous Nithari murders that allegedly occurred between 2005 and 2006, which came to light after the discovery of human remains near a house in Nithari in Uttar Pradesh's Noida in December 2006. Muninder Pandey, the owner of the house and his domestic help Surinder Kohli, were named in the FIRs. Following their convictions in the trial court, both individuals appealed to the Allahabad High Court. This week, a bench of Justice Ashwini Kumar Mishra and Justice Sayyad Aftab Hussain Rizvi announced their decision allowing the appeals filed by the duo. The court also slammed the Uttar Pradesh Police and the Central Bureau of Investigation for a casual and perfunctory probe into the murders. Further details of the judgment can be found on our website www.livelaw.in. An incident of public flogging in Gujarat's Kheda district last year drew widespread attention when a video of the incident went viral. The victims, a group of young Muslim men, were reportedly subjected to physical abuse by police officers in broad daylight following a communal clash in Undhela village during Navratri celebrations. Subsequently, a contempt plea was filed by five members of an affected family which has led to the Gujarat High Court finding four police officers guilty of contempt of court for violating the Supreme Court DK Basu guidelines on custodial torture. The officers have been sentenced to 14 days of simple imprisonment and each has been fined 2,000 rupees. However, the enforcement of the sentence has been stayed for three months, allowing time for the accused's counsel to appeal the decision. For more information, log on to www.livelaw.in. The Delhi High Court has rejected a petition filed by Aam Admi Party MP Sanjay Singh challenging his arrest and remand in the money laundering case related to the alleged liquor policy scam. Justice Swarnakanta Sharma emphasized that Singh, despite being a political figure, must be treated on par with any other accused in a criminal case. The court highlighted that while protecting one's public image is a right, it should not obstruct the state's right to investigate a crime. Additionally, the court deemed the petition premature since the investigation was still ongoing and therefore there was no basis to intervene with the order of remand or arrest. For more information, log on to www.livelaw.in. The Delhi High Court has allowed Aam Admi Party MP Raghav Chadha's appeal, challenging a trial court order allowing the Rajya Sabha Secretariat to evict him from a government bungalow. Chadha filed a suit contesting the cancellation of his accommodation, securing an interim order preventing his eviction without due process. However, this interim order was vacated by additional district judge Sudhanshu Kaushik last week. In a major relief to Chadha, this week the Delhi High Court allowed Chadha's appeal. The court also clarified the identity of the defendant, stating that while the Secretary General appears as the representative, the defendant in the suit is Rajya Sabha Secretariat. So if you want to know more about this case, log on to www.livelaw.in. That wraps up this week's Legal News Roundup.
But before I go, I have a little request from the entire Live Law team. We are an independent, fact-driven media organization that is committed to fearless and ethical journalism. To keep delivering your daily and weekly legal updates, especially in this dynamic audio-visual format, we need your support. So don't forget to do the fantastic six. Give our video a thumbs up. Share it with your family, friends, classmates, and colleagues. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and drop your thoughts and feedback in the comments below. Tap the bell icon to get your notifications. And lastly, swing by our website at www.livelaw.in for our in-depth reports. I am your host Sayyad Amir Hussain and I will see you again next time.